Hello and welcome to today's lecture on biological and biosocial theories and crime. I'm Danielle McCartney and I'll be guiding you through an overview of how biological and biosocial theories explain criminal behavior. Let's start with the early biological theories. These theories introduced the idea that criminal behavior could stem from biological or genetic factors. This marked a shift from viewing crime purely as a matter of free will. Cesar Lombroso, a key figure in this field, proposed the concept of atavism. According to Lombroso, some individuals are born criminals, exhibiting primitive features or stigmata that set them apart. He also identified dif different criminal types, including the born criminal, insane criminal, and criminaloid. Let's discuss these. Lombroso's concept of atavism is the belief that certain individuals are born criminals, reverting to a more primitive, less evolved state. He argued that these individuals could be identified by certain physical features, which he termed stigmata. These stigmata included characteristics like unusually large or small ears, peculiarities in eye size, asymmetry of the face, or excessive wrinkles. Lombroso believed these features were not just physical anomalies, but indicators of a deeper, inherent criminal nature. Expanding on this, Lombroso identified three main types of criminals, the born criminal, the insane criminal, and the criminaloid. The born criminal, according to Lombroso, is the most dangerous type. These individuals, he thought, were biologically predisposed to criminal behavior, inherently different from the average person. Next, the insane criminal. This includes individuals with mental disorders, particularly, but not exclusively, epileptics and psychotics, according to Lombroso anyway. Lombroso argued that these individuals commit crimes because of their mental instability, rather than a born criminal nature. Finally, the criminaloid. This type encompasses individuals who are not born criminals, but are driven to crime under certain circumstances, often influenced by passion or external pressures. Unlike the born criminal, the criminaloid does not exhibit the same physical stigmata. While Cesar Lombroso's theories were innovative for their time, they have faced significant critiques and evolution over the years. First, the scientific validity of Lombroso's methodology has been questioned. His approach to identifying born criminals based on physical stigmata lacks empirical support. Modern science does not support the notion that physical characteristics can reliably show criminal tendencies. Another major critique is Lombroso's deterministic view. His theory suggests that criminal behavior is biologically predetermined undermining the concept of free will. This perspective conflicts with later criminological theories that emphasize the role of personal choice and environmental factors in criminal behavior. Lombroso's theories also overgeneralize and stereotype. By categorizing individuals based on physical features, his approach risks reinforcing stereotypes and biases, which could lead to discriminatory practices in criminal justice. Also, Lombroso's focus on biological determinism largely neglects the impact of societal and environmental factors. Contemporary research highlights the importance of considering social context, upbringing, and environmental influences in understanding criminal behavior. Finally, the ethical implications of Lombroso's theories are a significant concern. The idea of born criminals could lead to fatalistic attitudes towards individuals with certain physical traits, potentially justifying unfair treatment and limiting rehabilitation efforts. Despite these critiques, it's important to recognize that Lombroso's work laid the foundation for future biological and biosocial theories in criminology. His theories prompted a shift from purely philosophical discussions of crime to more scientific inquiries, paving the way for a more nuanced understanding of the interplay between genetics, environment, and criminal behavior. Now, modern biosocial theories, particularly those under the umbrella of behavioral genetics, 
look to introduce ways that genetic factors interact with environmental influences. Behavioral genetics is a field that combines insights from biology, psychology, and genetics. It seeks to understand how both heredity and environment contribute to human behavior, including tendencies towards criminality. A key method in this field is adoption studies. These studies compare children raised by their biological parents with those raised by adoptive parents. This area also includes research on the concordance among twins, especially identical and fraternal twins. The aim is to analyze the influence of genetic factors on behavior by observing similarities and differences in criminal behavior between adopted children and their biological and adopted families. These studies examine the degree to which criminal behavior or law-abiding tendencies are similar in twins. Higher rates of concordance in identical twins as compared to fraternal twins can suggest a stronger genetic component in certain behaviors including criminality. Results from these kinds of studies have been mixed, but they provide valuable insights into the nature versus nurture debate. What's crucial in these contemporary biosocial theories is the recognition that genetics alone don't determine criminal behavior. Instead, it's the interaction between an individual's genetic predispositions and their environmental circumstances that shapes their likelihood of engaging in criminal activity. This perspective allows for a more nuanced understanding of criminal behavior, acknowledging the complexity of human nature and the multifaceted influences on our actions. Contemporary biosocial theories, therefore, mark a significant evolution from early deterministic views of Lombroso, for example. They encourage us to consider a broader range of factors, both biological and environmental, to understand and address criminal behavior. When we consider biological sources of criminality, the emphasis on punishment and deterrence from classical criminology comes into question. In classical criminology, deterrence is a key concept. The threat of punishment can prevent crime. However, if criminal behavior is influenced by genetic or biological predispositions, the effectiveness of deterrence is questionable. For instance, if an individual's propensity for aggression is influenced by a genetic factor, would the threat of jail time effectively deter them? Biological determinism suggests that certain individuals are predisposed to criminal behavior. Proponents of biological determinism then would question the role of punishment also. That is, if criminal behavior is rooted in biological factors, should our criminal justice system focus on rehabilitation and treatment? However, the concept of soft determinism gives us a more nuanced view. Soft determinism acknowledges the influence of genetic and biological factors, but also recognizes the role of environmental and personal choice factors. Soft determinism suggests that while our biological makeup might predispose us to certain behaviors, environmental factors and personal decisions also play a crucial role in shaping our actions. For example, a person might have a genetic predisposition to impulsivity, a trait associated with criminal behavior. Whether this trait leads to criminal actions may depend on environmental factors like upbringing, social influences, and personal experiences. Unlike theories that focus solely on either biological or social factors, biosocial theories look at the interplay between these elements. They propose that both inherent biological traits and external social conditions contribute to an individual's propensity for criminal behavior. A key example of this approach is biosocial arousal theory. This theory suggests that individuals with naturally low levels of physiological arousal might be more prone to criminal behavior. The reasoning is that these individuals may seek out stimulating and sometimes risky or illegal activities to compensate for their under aroused state. Furthermore, the theory posits that individuals with low arousal levels might have difficulty learning appropriate responses to aggression and violence. This is because the typical social and environmental cues that deter aggressive behavior may be less effective for them, leading to a higher likelihood of engaging in criminal acts. Biosocial arousal theory suggests that effective crime prevention strategies might need to include elements that address both the biosocial aspects, such as arousal levels, 
and the social environment, such as providing healthy and legal avenues for stimulation and aggression management. But biosocial theories don't stop at arousal levels. They encompass a range of factors, from genetic predispositions to environmental stressors, and how these elements collectively influence behavior. For example, Mednick's autonomic nervous system theory looks at the way our nervous system influences criminal behavior. The autonomic nervous system, or ANS, is part of our nervous system that controls involuntary bodily functions like heart rate and digestion. Mendick proposed that individuals with a slower reacting autonomic nervous system might be more prone to criminal behavior. The idea is that a less responsive ANS could lead to a reduced capacity to experience fear or anxiety in response to potential punishment or societal disapproval. This reduced fear response can, in turn, diminish the effectiveness of social and legal deterrence. Individuals with a slower ANS might not react to these deterrents in the same way as others, potentially leading to higher likelihood of engaging in risky or criminal activities. Mednick's theory also suggests that a slower ANS may impair an individual's abilities to control aggressive impulses. This impairment can cause a reduced capacity to regulate emotions and behaviors potentially leading to increased violence and criminal activity. However, it's important to note that Mednick's theory is one piece of a larger puzzle. While ANS may contribute to criminal behavior, it's the interaction of this biological factor with environmental and personal experiences that fully shapes an individual's actions. The insights from biological and biosocial theories challenge us to rethink our approaches within the criminal justice system. Perspectives that suggest a one-size-fits-all approach to punishment might not be the most effective. Understanding the underlying biological factors, as well as the interplay between these factors and social environments, could lead to more tailored interventions. For instance, targeted therapy and medication might be effective for addressing certain biological predispositions. At the same time, community-based programs, educational opportunities, and social support systems could help mitigate environmental factors that contribute to criminal behavior. So that's it for today. Thank you for joining me, and I hope you've learned a lot. Stay curious, keep learning, and I'll see you next time.